Okay, folks, if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to try to get going. We have a lot to cover today. Um, if you can, if you can follow most of what I'm telling you here, it's actually uh, probably the more complicated lecture that you're going to have before your midterm, and everything else will sort of be um, a little bit easier in terms of um, the types of things that um, I'll hold you responsible for, including things like GWA studies, uh, etc. So we're we're going to go back and take a look over the next uh, week or so in terms of um, genome editing. If you've been following any of the news right now. Um, you actually have ringside seats into this massive fight, and it is a fight, and it is actually becoming very personal, and it's becoming something that is um, going global. So right now there is a fight uh, in neuroscience related to genome editing, and it's really who owns genome editing, who owns CRISPR, who owns Cas9, should anyone actually own it, and if they do, the person who does own it will actually uh, become uh, not just famous, but also rich from all of these different pa uh, different patents. And so this is sort of the um, uh, context which I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. I showed you in the last lecture about the timeline, how quickly and how rapidly this technology um, evolved. This was actually taken today. And what, what has happened is Fong Zhang, who many of you have seen uh, here give a talk at U of T, Fong Zhang on one side at MIT is... Um, the current patent holder in the United States and in parts of uh, Europe for the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Um, in addition to that, though, he originally applied uh, with uh, two other individuals who are actually named here, Jennifer Doudna as well as Emmanuel Charpentier, are the two other people that are credited widely with owning or developing CRISPR-Cas9 the way that we use it right now, not the original version where people were trying to uh, get bacteria to have like immune-like processes. But these are the two individuals that um, were originally with Fong Zhang on this. It has no longer become just Fong Zhang versus uh, Jennifer Doudna. It has now become a fight between uh, MIT as well as uh, UC Berkeley and institutes in uh, Europe. And so you have ringside seats. When, when we go through today's paper, I want you to learn some of the details from today's paper because it's important. If you're going to really analyze, critically think about papers, those are important. But beyond that, sort of as an undercurrent for all of this, I want you to understand why they publish the way in which they publish. And I'll show you this uh, in two different settings today. I'll talk a little bit about Fong Zhang, uh, Fong Zhang's work, and then we will come back and talk about MDX. But the person that came up with um, the whole CRISPR technology, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, the one that is widely sort of uh, affiliated with that right now, Fong Zhang, he actually was not the first person to publish on using this technique in the nervous system. And I went through on, um, on uh, Thursday of last week why the nervous system is particularly amenable to this type of thing. Now, I'm not going to um, go through this in a lot of detail. And I'll tell you exactly what you need to know. But I, I need to revisit this before I can go through Roger Nichols' paper um, with you. As many of you know, within the nervous system, we have glutamate receptors, and then we have these GABAergic receptors. And they're the vast majority. 95% of all neurotransmission is done either through glutamate or GABA. There are other types. The vast majority of uh, neurotransmission is through glutamate. It's excitatory. The small 20% actually controls uh, the the whether or not that excitation actually means anything. So this glutamate neurotransmission can really work in two ways. It can either be a direct fast action or it can be through slow metabotropic effects through G protein coupled um, receptors. And we call these uh, metabotropic or mGluRs, uh, which I won't be talking about today, uh, versus the iGluRs or the ionotropic. One is really fast. As soon as glutamate binds, it opens, the cell starts to respond. The other one takes time. It takes much longer for it to respond if it binds the same um, glutamate. We're more interested, to be honest, in neuroscience about ionotropic or the iGluRs because we think they're rapidly modifiable. They work really quickly, and the way that our brain works is really quick, and so we're more interested in some of the uh, iGluRs rather than the mGluRs right now. So again, you don't need to worry about all of the details that are on this particular slide, nor, nor should you be too concerned about um, the, the manner in which this was recorded. It's to give you an idea 
of what we mean by metabotropics, low effects versus rapid effects. If I have a neuron and I am puffing on glutamate using electrophysiological techniques, I will be able to generate what is known as a fast excitatory postsynaptic potential or a fast EPSP. And you can see that it is very fast. As soon as I puff on glutamate, and I would puff on glutamate here, you would see this rapid increase in the membrane potential. This is that spike and a rapid decline uh, in that uh, membrane potential as well. If we are talking about uh, a slow EPSP where we are adding in a glutamate and another neuron, this would actually, this process, even though it looks like it's relatively sharp, because the time frame is much, much slower. It's on the order of minutes, not milliseconds. It's not, not even seconds. It's one minute. You can imagine the time course or the kinetics. And this is done usually with a, a G protein coupled receptor with the slow EPSP. And this is a fast ionotropic or an iGluar that you see here. And again, I just needed you to get that sort of context. Uh, and again, there are some other changes if you're really paying attention, the size of the uh, potential change is also different, as you can see on this diagram. And again, don't worry about the details. It's just to give you some context. I will be very clear and very explicit on the types of things that I need you to make sure that you know. So how, how do they actually go about measuring these postsynaptic potentials? Many of you will have seen these same diagrams multiple times. Some of you who are taking CSB 332 or other courses in neurobiology will actually go into this in more detail. We can actually do a couple of things, and this is important in the context of the paper that I'm going to present to you. We can take a sharp electrode, usually a glass micropipette that we pulled, and we can go and touch a neuron that you see here, and when that electrode is touching that neuron, in some instances, underneath that electrode as it's touching, we will be able to entrap a small number of uh, different types of receptors and or channels. And depending on how we do things, we can either be in a whole cell configuration um, down here on the bottom, and it tells you that this is a whole cell uh, patch recording, or we could decide to pull off the membrane. And again, I'm not going to go into that in any detail. I'm mentioning this because in today's paper, Roger Nichols' group actually uses this whole cell recording technique. It is a very powerful technique. If you were to walk into a lab, you would not be able to do this right away. It, it, it takes a lot of time, a lot of skill, and a lot of practice uh, to be able to do this. And in, in neuro, we actually say um, that it is easier for you to convert an electrophysiologist into a molecular biologist than to go the other way. You, it's harder for you as a molecular cellular person to learn how to do this than it is for someone who can do this to learn uh, to do molecular biology. And again, just to put things in perspective for you, because this course, we are going to talk about this off and on. And again, don't worry about the details. The fact that it's whole cell, uh, it's just for your own information, and this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a cell. This is a neuron, and you can see part of the electrode up here. It is much, much bigger than the neuron, many, many times bigger than the cytoplasm of that neuron. And we'll have to keep that in mind later in the course when we talk about these techniques. Now, again, I want to be, um, I want to know how much information you know. If you're looking at this diagram, whether it's up here or you're looking at this diagram on your notes, can you tell me like what kind of preparation this is? Is this a slice? I've taken a slice of the brain. It is, is it actually taken from the brain? What kind of preparation do you think it is? Yes. Is it in vivo? Okay, why do you think it's in vivo? Could be in vivo. It's not, but it could be. One might give it away as in vivo or not in vivo? Anyone else want to make a guess and, and help out here? So this is what is known as a dissociated uh, cell culture. And some of you will have done this in your third year neuroscience labs where you take apart cells, neurons, and then you grow them in culture. They're flat. They're lying flat and growing on the surface like a table. And this is why you can see it the way that you do. We don't normally see neurons in that sort of orientation. And again, just for your own information and to tell me a little bit about um, what I should try to explain to you. 
So all of these ionotropic fasts, really quick, on the order of milliseconds, bind glutamate, have this really rapid rise in, in postsynaptic potentials, and then come back really quickly. Uh, we have many, many different types of fast ionotropic glutamate receptors. We have things that respond pharmacologically. They respond to glutamate, but they also sp respond to AMPA. We have another type that responds to glutamate, but responds to NMDA and will not respond to AMPA. And we have a third type that is pharmacologically responsive to canic acid or canate as it's represented here. And all of these bind glutamate and all of these are fast, but all of them have their own unique uh, pharmacological activators. So an NMDA receptor is not the same type of glutamate receptor as an AMPA, nor is it the same uh, type as a canate receptor. They're similar, they're like cousins, but you can tell the difference uh, using these specific pharmacological reagents. So most of the interest actually has revolved around two of these, AMPA and NMDA. And today's paper from Roger Nichols' group actually concentrates on both the AMPA and NMDA. One of the reasons for this, especially in the hippocampus, these have been shown to be really important in mod modulating synaptic plasticity. And we know many of the molecular players that um, center around AMPA, glutamate receptors, and NMDA glutamate receptors. Do you have any questions before I go on or anything that you want to clarify right now before I go on? I'm hoping some of it is a review for you and some of it is a refresher. And this is all the information I really want you to take away from this one slide. Now, this is a really busy looking slide. And I don't need you to memorize all of the details on this slide. I'm not going to be asking you uh, all sorts of questions about what is uh, sort of the uh, proteins that cluster around um, piccolo in the presynaptic compartment, what clusters around bassoon in the presynaptic compartment, those aren't really that important. I want you to go back though and think about what we talked about on um, Thursday. And on Thursday we said that one of the reasons why we need these really advanced genome editing techniques that can manipulate the genome long term, not not it's over and done with RNAi, it works, but the effects disappear with time. When we talk about these excitatory synapses, because of the huge number of um, other molecules, not just the AMPA receptor, not just the NMDA receptor, not just the kinate receptors that you see here, we have other associated proteins that go along with them. We have things like the postsynaptic density proteins. We have what is known as the glutamate receptor interacting protein or GRIP. All of these things are there in this region on this postsynaptic membrane. And on, on an EM, on an electron micrograph, we can actually see this as a density. It is jam packed with different proteins. It is incredibly difficult to manipulate groups of proteins. If you took, for example, it's like playing Jenga. If I remove something from the postsynaptic density, everything might fall apart. And so one of the reasons why we're interested in this is in the short term, when everything is built already, if we remove one of these blocks, maybe one of these blocks uh, like neural ligand, uh, neural ligand would be a bad example. Neural ligand, the, the whole Jenga pile would fall apart. Uh, maybe if we remove something like grip ABP, let's see what happens to the AMPA receptor. Maybe we could do that using CRISPR Cas9. But because of the density of what's going on, it makes it really, really hard to do these types of manipulations unless we talk about uh, CRISPR Cas9. And again, just diagrammatically, you can see that this postsynaptic density, which is the entire collection of proteins that you see here in this postsynaptic region, and this is the postsynaptic neuron, this is the presynaptic neuron. When we take a look at this as a whole, we can see that it is jam-packed with different types of proteins, and it's, it's very, very stable. Okay, do you have any questions about this or anything that you wanted to clarify about what you need to know? I don't need to memorize all of the individual components or the different things. I wanted to use this slide to show you why we talk about some of the limitations on the technologies that existed before CRISPR that we mentioned um, on Thursday. Yes? So, so shRNA or RNAi like technologies, they're really useful. There, there are a number of limitations, and let me be clear on this. You need to know some of those limitations. RNA intrinsically has hairpin loops, so it makes it really difficult to predict if it's going to work effectively. So usually, 
end up generating a whole bunch. And I'll show you that even today. So, number two, once that RNAi disappears, the effects disappear. So the RNAi is no longer there. It hasn't manipulated the genome long term, and the effects are gone when the RNAi is gone. Yes? Yep, and, and even with lentiviruses, and even with lentiviruses using CRISPR-Cas9, you have to actually go and improve that this is lasting long-term. You're 100% correct. However, with RNAi and um, RNAi to, uh, SHR RNAs, you still have limitations on the lasting effects. As far as we know, CRISPR, when you do genome editing and you create these indels which break the, uh, the gene apart, then that's a long-lasting effect. And again, everyone has to actually demonstrate and show that it is a la long lasting effect. With RNAi, it can actually rebound and recover. Okay? It's a great point, and thanks for bringing that up. Any, any other questions or things that I can clarify for you now? Yes, at the back. So, so why not? Once, once you started to develop um, embryonic stem cell technology, it became much easier for you to actually generate knockout animals. When I was a, when I was a graduate student, for example, it was entirely possible for you to have your own thesis just by knocking out a gene and, and demonstrating that you could knock it out. And that was your whole thesis, that so you could do it. However, once ES cells came along and you could do uh, and create transgenic knockouts really quickly from these ES cells through homologous recombination techniques, it is much more difficult to actually, uh, not more difficult, it is um, less likely that you're going to be able to show that if you knock something out right from the beginning in the germline, that when it becomes an adult, that there is no either compensation or it's not lethal. So for example, if we knocked out uh, one of the glutamate receptors, will the animal survive? Yes, it will. And I'll show you that even in CRISPR it can, but there is compensation by the other receptors that bind glutamate. And so we're not, we're not sure, like, are we seeing the real effect of just that one receptor or not? Yes. So, none of those so which ones of these are lethal? So for example, if you were to knock out things that um, are uh, related to uh, the connections between the pre and postsynaptic neurons, so neural ligand and norexin, which um, act as guideposts for each other, then it becomes less likely that the animal will survive long term. Um, but not all of them are lethal. That's correct. If I knocked out some of the presynaptic proteins, actually they turn out to be more lethal than the postsynaptic ones. So if I knock out some of the synaptobrevins uh, or some of the other uh, proteins, then the animal doesn't survive and uh, usually uh, it doesn't go through full development, okay? All right, so um, I'm not going to ask you to memorize the slides, just to give you an idea of um, some of the things that we need to talk about. If you're really interested in this, I can go through this in more detail with you. Um, these are the classic receptors that you see here, um, including things like the um, GABA receptor-like uh, subunits or the acetylcholine, uh, nicotinic acetylcholine-like receptors. But this is the one that um, I'm most interested in. And this is the one that looks like the uh, different subunits of the AMPA, uh, NMDA, and KNA type. And all of them look the same like this. So with AMPA, which is what I'm going to be concentrating on, and NMDA, we have four different subunits that come together. Four of these different subunits come together to form the NMDA receptor or the AMPA receptor. And they all have this same topology. If they come together, four of them, in the right way, they will form something like this. And this happens to be the NMDA receptor because you can see that the NMDA receptor has this magnesium block at rest. So why, why is all of this important? Um, and why, why do we, as uh, geneticists and even neuroscience students, why do you actually have to worry about all of this? We still use electrophysiology. It might sound like a really outdated technique, but in order for us to actually see whether or not something is successful, 
we will use what is known as an IV plot that is shown here. So we can uh, look at uh, current at the top versus potential here on the bottom. So I, the current, versus the voltage. And the shape of the IV curve actually tells us a lot about what ions are flowing through. Now again, some of you will take CSB332. You'll learn more about this. It's just to give you an idea because I'm going to show you IV plots later. But I'm not going to go into that in any detail now. If you're really curious about it, um, I'll tell you like why it goes through zero, why it's a linear line, why it doesn't uh, slope this way or that way. But that for us right now, it's not important. When glutamate binds, though, and, and this is important, when glutamate binds, we can actually dissect apart, even though they're both really rapid, both really fast. When glutamate binds on an EPSC, which is similar to an EPSP, we see this early phase is due to AMPA and this late phase is due to NMDA. We can actually take those two components apart. And again, all of this is on the order of milliseconds. It's very, very fast. But AMPA is faster than NMDA. Okay, so that is something I want you to make sure that you take away from this diagram that AMPA is different than NMDA and pharmacologically NMDA and AMPA are not identical either. Do you have any questions about this? For those of you who are in genetics, is that, an, is that okay for you in terms of neuroscience? Yes. So if I were to apply glutamate here at time zero, the first spike that I would see going up, the increase in the current that I would see going up, it would actually be due to AMPA. Now, how do I know that? I'm going to show you that a little bit later on. Um, and the second part of this curve would actually be due to NMDA. Okay, So when glutamate binds, it doesn't care where it's binding. It binds first to AMPA, causes the spike, and then the NMDA receptor gets activated after. But we can measure both, and we can take them apart. But that's important. If I'm adding glutamate, how do I know I'm affecting AMPA, or how do I know I'm affecting NMDA? So if that's your question, that's a brilliant question. That was your question, right? OK, you're brilliant. Thank you. So I'll, I'll come back to that um, again in a few moments. This is the, pro, uh, this is the uh, paper that was first. This was the first paper ever published uh, in a journal that um, actually used CRISPR-Cas9. It was not Fong Zhang. It was not Jennifer Doudna. It was not Emmanuel Char Charpentier. It was Roger Nickel. And Roger Nickel actually purposely went out and tried to be the first to publish on this. Some of you who know um, Electrophys and know Roger Nickel um, down in uh, UCSF will know that he has been doing uh, synaptic physiology. He was actually the first person to suggest that LTP was a uh, biological phenomenon at synapses. And he's been involved in synaptic protein and studying synaptic proteins for a very, very long uh, period of time. He cloned one of the accessory AMPA receptor proteins. He cloned stargazing uh, along with his postdoc at the time. So he's been involved in this for a very long time. This group has been using hippocampal slice preparations. The hippocampus is an area of the brain that has lots of AMPA receptors, lots of NMDA receptors, and lots of postsynaptic proteins. He's been doing this for a very, very long time. And as I mentioned to you in the past, or I've mentioned to you even in the last lecture, um, when I do single cells, if I were to take cells apart and then I were to grill them as a flat culture here and I can do electrophys and bring in that massive electrode on top of it, that is challenging enough. But if I were to actually cut an entire slice out and then I were to grow that slice in culture and then I were to try to infect or transfect uh, those neurons, within that slice, that's another layer of difficulty. It's another added sort of technological um, disadvantage. We have to actually use techniques that are uh, unique to uh, slices. So for example, I'm going to show you in this particular paper, and he is famous for using a gene gun. He uses biolistics. He will create the guide RNAs. He will create the uh, plasmids that will then deliver Cas9, and he coats gold nanoparticles before injecting them into the nuclei using uh, a gun. Or you could use viral infection, which you'll see with uh, Fong Zhang's paper in the second half. So again, when you do this, it's not very efficient. But actually, he uses this to his advantage. So if I have two cells, 
like if you are a molecular biologist, your thinking would be completely different. If I have two cells, uh, sorry, if I have a whole group of cells and I want to see if I'm changing the expression of a protein or a gene, one of the things that I would want to do is I want as much of that effect as possible. I want everything being affected. I want 100% efficiency. He doesn't care. Actually, what he wants to do is this, this cell over here is affected and the one right beside it is not. But because they work in the same way, if I change genes over on the right and the one on the left is still unaffected, it's a perfect control in that slice. So this is what he is using to measure the effectiveness of uh, whether or not knocking out a gene uh, actually works. So as I mentioned to you before, these NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors, both of them as the members of the ionotropic glutamate receptors, actually fall into uh, or have four different subunits. One of these is essential. You need to have the GLU-N1 subunit of NMDA to actually make an NMDA receptor. So he wanted to know, if I knock out GLU-N1, one of the essential subunits, can I eliminate NMDA receptor responses from my slice? That was his uh, first thing. Can I use CRISPR-Cas9 in order to be able um, to do this. Uh, AMPA receptors consist of four different subunits, GLUA1, GLUA2, GLUA3. Uh, it's a little bit misleading because GLUA4 actually in um, adult brains doesn't exist. It's a developmental isoform that's found in neonatal brains, doesn't exist in mature brains, but we put it up there because there are only four subunits, but the vast majority are GLUA1, GLUA2, and GLUA3. And all of these are heterotetramers. Most AMPA receptors, and this, is a, this was a cause of controversy in the late 1990s and in the early parts of the 2000s, no one could agree on this. Most AMPA receptors contain the GLUA2 subunit, okay? That makes it unique. GLUA2 prevents calcium from flowing in. If you've ever sat there wondering in, in any of your lectures, these, these receptor subunits look identical. NMDA fluxes calcium. And you're telling me that AMPA receptors are identical to NMDA receptors. Why doesn't AMPA receptors flux cl calcium through when glutamate binds? It's because of GLUA2. GLUA2 undergoes what is known as RQ editing, and so it prevents calcium from flowing through. So he wanted to know, if I remove GLUA2, can I actually go in and detect this using electrophysiology? So very, very simple questions on this really powerful paper, the first paper that came out um, in neurobiology to use this CRISPR-Cas9. And again, just some technical notes that I wanted you uh, to be aware of. So we don't get 100% transfection. We don't get 100% of the neurons in that area taking up or showing that they've been um, transfected. Even if we hit a massive area, it's, it's less likely uh, to, it's more likely that about 1% of the neurons will be um, actually affected. He is using this technique of using biolistics, where he has these small gold nanoparticles that he will then um, have DNA being attached to, uh, as well as the guide RNAs, and then he will shoot them at tissue, whether it's a mammalian slice or a mammalian cell, you can uh, take these clusters of gold particles and bombard the nucleus. And it's, uh, it's a lot like target practice. So even if you hit the tissue, which most of you should be able to do, you have to stochastically be able to hit the nuclei. That bullet has to be able to hit a nucleus to deliver the payload into the nucleus. If it hits the cytoplasm, it may or may not work. But if it hits the nucleus and you can see the bullet in the nucleus, you can actually uh, have a greater likelihood that the effects will be observed. So he is using this technique of biolistics to shoot groups of uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, guide RNAs into this cell uh, or groups of cells in this hippocampal slice. Now, this is a very uh, busy slide, and I know that not all of you are um, have the same background in neurobiology. Some of you have taken the third year neuroscience course and some of you have not. So I'm gonna take you through what I want you uh, to know. So the diagram up here on the top is from his paper. And what he is examining is the overall effectiveness of what happens when he uh, knocks out the NR1 subunit. So he's only concentrating on the NMDA receptors at the very top uh, in terms of what he should see. So remember, in 
in uh, excitatory synapses that bind glutamate, they either bind AMPA receptors or NMDA. They could bind kinate. There are not very many in the hippocampus that we really care about. And so how can we tease apart whether or not he's effectively eliminated the uh, NMDA uh, receptor? And one of the things that he shows uh, is that he can pharmacologically manipulate the slice to show that he can actually uh, have both types of receptors there. So he's recording, and what he sees here is in the presence of uh, NBQX, which is an AMPA receptor um, antagonist, it blocks AMPA receptors, nothing flows through it, that he sees this large, slow response. That is his NMDA response. To show that this response that he is sees in the presence of NBQX, which is an AMPA receptor antagonist, this response that he sees here, if he then adds in the same preparation, the same neuron that he is recording from over here, he adds another pharmacological agent, AP5, which is an NMDA receptor antagonist, he measures nothing, okay? So he's able to show that AMPA exists here, and NMDA exists here, and that in the presence of AMPA receptor or an NMDA receptor blocker, he can eliminate current. But the actual current isn't the ones in black. His actual current is the one down here in green. He's measuring NMDA, he's putting on glutamate, and he's looking for an NMDA response. He sees nothing. The NMDA after CRISPR-Cas9 is completely gone. It is a flat line. He doesn't even need to add any of the um, agonists. This is the response that he sees when he puts on glutamate or NMDA. He had to show that he could um, actually demonstrate that there are uh, neurons around. The adjacent neurons are still responsive, so it's not that the neurons are dead. It worked. It worked perfectly. These are the NMDA responses in response to either glutamate application, no response at all, in other words. We should see something that looks like this, nothing. Nothing at all, and uh, you don't even need an NMDA receptor blocker. His experiments worked almost perfectly. Okay, so when you go back and you take a look at the effectiveness of the dis different CRISPR-Cas9s uh, and whether or not you use APV or not, just by knocking down the NMDA receptor subunit here, CRISPR, plus the NMDA gene knockdown through CRISPR, you get the same effects as if you block with an NMDA receptor antagonist. It is that powerful. He can also show on a Western blot that when he goes back and takes a look, if he looks for the gluon one subunit after adding uh, CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out the uh, NMDA receptor, nothing, no protein. No protein, no subunit, no NMDA receptor responses. This was the first demonstration that in that tightly clustered region of the postsynaptic density that you could actually knock out a gene completely and also electrophysiologically demonstrate the lack of that current as well. It sounds like a really great story. I mean, yes, Danny. So just to clarify the difference between the black and the black. The black is the, um, the black is the adjacent cell that's not being affected. He needs to demonstrate, how else could I have a flat line? The cell might be dead, right? It, it might be glowing, but it might be dead. And so he has to demonstrate that it's actually there and he does a number of other things. I won't go through all of the different techniques, but when you patch onto a cell, you can actually measure the uh, resistance of the membrane. And that tells you if the cell is still intact or not. And he does all of those types of things. But this is just a little razzle-dazzle to show you that it, it's completely gone. Any, anything else that you guys are curious about or need me to explain in more detail? Yes. Correct. So this is where CRISPR has come in, the green on the bottom, but you're not seeing any NMDA related current. It is that um, effective. And you can see this is the number of cells. Each of those little open circles is the number of cells that he's recorded from. Every last one of them has no NMDA receptor currents. It is identical to having just AP5, the receptor antagonist, blocking all NMDAs or doing this plus uh, AP5, okay? And he's being a really uh, careful uh, neurobiologist. So there's another thing that I actually wanted to show you from this. Nowadays, it's great to be able to demonstrate all of this is occurring. And there's no doubt that on a Western blot in the second um, 
grouping from the top that when we stain on a Western for the gluon one subunit, when we use CRISPR for the GRIN one subunit, it's gone. It's completely wiped out. Okay, we don't see a band. This is what we should normally see on the right, and on the left is what happens when we use CRISPR. It is completely eliminated. Yes. Yeah, so I didn't show you, well, I, I showed you some edited data. Um, right now, he's only worried about the NMDA receptor. He wants to show the NMDA receptor effects. He's also looking at, in the second part, the effects on the AMPA receptors. Uh, in theory, it shouldn't make any difference to the NMDA, but in, but in reality, it, it might. You're, so you're right to ask that question. Um, I mentioned to you, and by the way, you should know this because you're going to get this as a short answer question because it's important that when, when you get these things and you read it in the newspapers or you read it online, that you understand parts of the technique, even if you haven't done it yourself. Um, these are all of the PAM sequences. We need these. These help to guide the um, guide RNAs in order for the nuclease to cut specific regions. And what he did was each of the cells that he recorded from he was able to do micro sequencing. He was able to suck out, because remember you have this big electrode that you're recording from. You can actually suck out the contents of the cell, including the nucleus, into your electrode, and you can do sequencing on that DNA. And when he sees this, one of the things that he sees, if CRISPR works, if CRISPR is actually causing uh, DNA to be cut, he should be able to see cuts, and in fact, in every cell that he looks at, he either sees a cut, so he sees these two base pairs are gone, cut. Therefore, the protein doesn't get uh, transcribed nor translated the way that it should. This is also cut completely um, as expected. So does this one. Here he has a really big stretch of cuts that occurs after CRISPR-Cas9 and this as well. And one of the other things that he was the first to show actually in this paper is that CRISPR sometimes causes not just deletions that you see on the top uh, sort of five uh, sequences here, but he also saw an insertion. So an insertion itself is enough to silence this gene, and this insertion is long-lasting. It's out of frame now. It can't produce the protein that it normally should, and that whatever it produces is is not effective as an NMDA receptor subunit. Yes. So I thought that, I thought that CRISPR-Cas9, like, um, I guess, charm might be that it can target specific sequences to create cuts and then the body does whatever it does from there. Um, but if you have, if in looking at different, I guess, cells that you sequence or micro sequence, there's like big, big deletions or like, they don't yep. seem to have like a homogenous. Okay, so so again, I'm not going to go through this in a, in a lot of uh, detail, Danny. Um, I will show you this on the, the next Fang Zhang paper because I actually have that as a slide. Um, these are the results of different guide RNAs, and, and different guide RNAs will target differently, but, but yes. So if you're asking why are they all over the place and not at specific regions, uh, one of the things that you have to demonstrate, and I'll show you on a nuclease protection assay with Fong Zhang, that um, you actually have to demonstrate that it is cutting at a certain region at a certain e efficacy, and then demonstrate that multiple ways. And I'll get back to that a little bit later on. It's a good question, by the way. Yes. So, so he's here in this bottom part characterizing the different guide RNAs. You will see that Fang Zhang does the same. Everyone, you, you create like a dozen different guide RNAs. You try them. You, in theory, every last one of them works equally well, but in practice, not all of them do. Oh, that's a great question. That's, that's, a, that's a great question. Yeah, dude, if, if I have the same guide RNA and I have two different cells and I put the same guide RNA in different cells, will they work identically? In theory, yes. In practicality, uh, in, in the actual world, we're not as sure, okay? It's a great question. Because remember, the big issue that, the, the reason why people aren't using CRISPR right now or haven't used CRISPR in therapy is that there are off-target effects. Right, and uh, that's a great question. I'll ask you to hold on to that thought for the time being. Okay, um, 
I'm not going to go through all of the details here, and some of this relies on your um, ability to understand some of the electrophys and some of the uh, relationships in the IV curve. Again, green showing that you're knocking out the glue R2 uh, subunit um, that you see here. Um, and you'll actually see that it does something very weird, a little bit unexpected, or maybe not unexpected, where it actually uh, exhibits this type of rectification. Um, later on in the course, I'll come back to this weird shaped curve. It's not straight, it's not linear, so this is what it should look like. This black bar is almost a perfect um, straight line, but you can see the green bar. After CRISPR, uh, the slope changes, and, it, and then it just lies flat. It undergoes what is known as rectification if I have time later, I'll come back and talk to you about this. The, the take home message is that if you knock out glue R2, the, this neuron now becomes calcium permeable. He is able to demonstrate that knocking out glue R2 makes the remaining amperoceptors, the subunits, into a calcium permeable uh, type of receptor. And again, we won't worry about all of the details um, on this particular slide. Um, uh, again, with the background, some of you having more uh, more genetics and some of you having more uh, neuroscience background, we won't uh, spend a lot of time on this particular slide. Suffice it to say that yes, amperoceptors demonstrate uh, exactly the, what he had suspected, that you can knock out glue, glue A2 or the glue R2 subunit and uh, this now becomes calcium permeable uh, in the way that you would think that it does. Um, these results, by the way, he, he was actually really careful in the sense that he did them at various time points. Um, one week after CRISPR application, after biolistics, uh, a few weeks after, and he was able to demonstrate, and that's one of the reasons why he uses uh, slice cultures. Um, maybe I'll ask you this question. Some of you are working in research labs. Do any of you work with primary cell cultures? I'm not talking cell lines. I'm talking about primary cell cultures. Yeah, I'm not so sure about your lab. <laughs> Primary cell cultures? I'm not talking stem cell cultures or stem cell derived cultures. Then no, okay. Anyone working with primary cultures? Yes. How long How long do they last for? Not too long. Like, after like probably like three weeks. Yeah, so, so generally speaking, a dissociated culture is somewhere between 14 days in vitro and 21 days in vitro, two to four weeks. These slices you can keep around for much, much longer, like months at a time. And so he's able to go back and, and look at this longer term than we would with individual uh, dissociated cultures. And he's able to demonstrate that these are long lasting effects. If you knock this thing down with CRISPR, it stays knocked down, it's gone. It is not a short lasting effect, it is not washed out, that these are all very long lasting and for the most part, uh, very effective. So the one take home that I want you to remember is that CRISPR-Cas9 causes a deletion event or an insertion event which uh, breaks apart the reading frame of that, um, of that gene which means that that uh, protein product is not being uh, produced. So this gets into like the main course. This is, in many ways, the coolest paper or the scariest paper that you'll ever read. In some ways, it's scary in the sense that in order for you to get published in Nature, you have to do all this uh, crazy stuff. And again, just keep in mind a couple of things. This paper was submitted uh, to Nature in May, uh, at the end of May in 2014. So again, Roger Nichols' paper came out in September of uh, 2014, um, and then it got accepted in October. He had to do a lot of experiments, and um, I can I can tell you that, you know, when when you have a paper and you know that someone else is doing the same types of experiments, and science is really competitive, you know, his their postdocs were probably not going home on the weekends. They were probably doing all these experiments to try to get this back into nature as soon as possible. And so it might sound like a lot of time between May and October, but the reality is that it, it was probably a lot of work sort of behind the scenes. And this is sort of the uh, big paper with Fong Zhang. This is, this is not a trivial paper. Uh, if you can read this paper, you can understand like any genetics or any molecular cellular biological um, paper. So a couple of things and then we'll take uh, a quick break. Up until now, whenever you read uh, about uh, CRISPR-Cas9, we are really talking about the uh, Cas9 gene, the nuclease. Remember, it, 
there are two parts to the nuclease. This nuclease that we're talking about, the Cas9 nuclease, is all derived originally from Streptococcus uh, pyogenes. So this Streptococcus pyogenes, this Cas9 nuclease that we're talking about, which is um, abbreviated in most papers as SP for Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9, is really where the patent fight is being fought right now. Who owns this? Well, Jennifer Dudna was the first person to actually publish this, along with Emmanuel uh, Charpentier. Uh, but Fang Zhang actually perfected the technique. He developed it even further that allowed for it to be used in mammalian systems, not in other systems. Do you have a question, Danny? No. No, no worries. Um, and so when we use this, just like um, Roger Nichols shows, if it's doing its job, it is creating insertion or, in Roger Nichols' case, deletions uh, or indel mutations, where we have both either an insertion or a deletion, an indel mutation. And that means that the um, protein isn't formed because the reading frame has been disrupted. So when you take a look, outside of Roger Nichols' paper, most of, this, of the original publications that started in 2012 and then a massive amount in 2013, they were all done in cell lines which divide by nature um, or, or were done in replicating cells, cells that normally divide, okay? Post-mitotic neurons, and I mentioned this briefly in passing, make it much more difficult um, to actually do these types of experiments. The other thing is by the time they were ready to publish, there were very, very few publications that were actually done uh, in vivo. So all of these were done in cell cells or in cell lines, but very few were actually done um, in vivo. And keep all of this in mind as a context that science is competitive, you're in a race, he is um, trying to publish this, and what might be the reasons why he's trying to publish all the things that he is? Um, okay, I'm going to go through this one slide. I don't need you to uh, memorize all of this. I'm going to take you through a couple of things. In Fang Zhang's paper, at the time that it was published back in 2014, so, you know, that massive two years ago, right, that uh, he published this, um, one of the things that is a constraint is right now we have a limited size to package things. Imagine having a suitcase and you need to package all this stuff inside this suitcase that's of a certain size. And this is the limitation that he's running into. He can't go much farther than this 4.8 kilobases. Beyond that, it's not going to all fit. So some things he has to be able to package. So these um, inver inverse terminal repeats, the ITRs, those of you who are in molecular cell biology, ITRs are used for what? ITRs. It's a dead giveaway, inverse terminal repeats. It's used by viruses. So we, in order for us to package this into a virus to allow it to be um, used by a virus, we need these ITRs. We need those, but very, very short. We don't have to worry too much about them. We need a promoter. In this case, he's using the MECP2 promoter, which I'll get back to um, in a moment. He is using a very, very small tag to identify whether or not SP uh, Cas9 is actually used, um, and a nu nuclear localization signal. He wants to make double sure that this Cas9 is being targeted to the nucleus. So he's using a very small stretch of uh, genomic information to direct this Cas9 specifically to the nucleus using this nuclear, nuclear localization signal, or NLS. And this is the Cas9, the vast majority of what he's packing into the suitcase, which is the adenovirus, that's what he's putting in. That's just one adenovirus. He can't pack the guide RNA. He has to use a separate virus to do this. It'd be great if he could package it all into one. And that's what everyone is now racing for. Can we do all of this into one virus? But there is a size constraint right now. So everyone is trying to race to try to make something that will fit into one suitcase rather than carrying two. So not only does he have to create this one virus, he actually has to create this other virus to go along with it. He has to do two injections of two different viruses, in other words. So um, again, let me just ask, what is a SIN1, do you think? Those of you who are in neuro, and what might that be used for? Oh, let me, let me tell you a couple of things, and, and it's worthwhile writing down. It's on their, your slides, but it's worthwhile writing down. I'm using a promoter known as MACP2, right? 
This is that promoter. Whenever you see this arrow, it's a promoter. Here's another promoter on a different plasmid. Um, MECP2, why would I use MECP2? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. So we use MECP2 because it's widely expressed in neurons. We expect to see this in every neuron that's infected. We expect it to have MECP2. Perfect. It's a more or less a neuron-specific promoter. What about this? What is this? SYN1. Yes. Synapsin1. Do you find synapsin as a protein and therefore the gene in neurons or glia? You're right, the, you should have turned your head the other way and went with neurons. Yes, you're right, neurons. So both of these are targeting neurons. So he wants to see this effect, both of these, in neurons. There are lots of reasons that we won't get into today of why he didn't use the same promoter. Um, why not use like SYN1 here and MECP2 there um, on the same thing? Um, again, just before we take a break, one other thing, this is the guide RNA, very, very short. This is what is going to um, make the Cas9 go to the appropriate complementary sequence, and this is what's going to drive the nuclease activity. So this is being driven into a promoter that will also express GFP. So wherever he has the guide RNA, that's going to glow green with this green fluorescent um, protein, okay? And the other elements you don't need to really worry about, and I will talk to you about cash. Or do any of you know what cash is? Students never have enough cash. Cash? I'm going to just jump ahead because I, I wrote it down. It's there for you. I'll come back to it. And this is that uh, it's a homology domain. It actually does something similar. Let me, let me ask you to think for a second like neurobiologists, molecular biologists, and geneticists. This is targeted toward neurons, and it's targeted toward the nucleus. This is targeted toward neurons. Where else would you have to ensure that this is targeted? To the nucleus. So this cache domain actually targets the outer membrane of the nucleus. Okay. So both systems are targeting neurons, here with MECP2, here with synap synapsin, and they are also targeting the nucleus with the nuclear localization signal or uh, with cache. And so they're both going through different routes to the same place. Yes? Um, maybe Okay, that is a great question, and, and yes, we have to talk a, a little bit about it. Um, as neurobiologists, it's kind of like um, you, you have a whole host of different types of viruses that you could use. You could use lentiviruses. You could decide to use herpes simplex viruses. They'll all affect, infect neurons. Our, our vectors of choice, though, generally speaking, and, and this is why we do these in undergraduate labs, are these replication deficient viruses, the AAVs. They're the ones, it's a lot like if you had a choice, would you rather drive a Toyota or would you rather drive BMW? Please don't say Toyota because that would wreck my analogy. And so as neurobiologists, we want to use this replication deficient BMW. We could use something else, but that's our uh, vector of choice. And I mentioned that in the last lecture as well. Yes, at the back, and then we'll take a break. There, there are different flavors of lentiviruses as well, and there are lots of considerations. The speed of onset, the duration of uh, infectivity, there are a number of factors. Some, some including like practical aspects. Some labs are um, designed specifically to be able to grow uh, lenti, and some are designed specifically to grow AAV or other types of viruses. So there are some uh, technical considerations. How about we take a break? If you have any other questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Thank you for the questions, by the way. It makes it um, a lot more interesting, and it makes uh, sure that I'm trying to answer all your questions uh, for you as well. Okay, folks, if you don't mind, I'm going to try to get going. We still have quite a number of slides to get through, and we have a lot of data uh, to get through as well. I was asked a really important question and a really good question during the break. Sorry, and that question was related to um, what is HA? HA is a very small 
epitope tag. It's normally not found in cells. It is part of um, hemagglutinin. And hemagglutinin, the HA part, is something that we have an antibody for. So this small stretch of about eight amino acids is unique. We don't find it in mammalian cells at all. It does not exist. The only way that we would detect HA is if, it, if um, uh, it, the cell was infected by a completely foreign virus somehow, which doesn't happen in a laboratory setting, um, and we would be able to detect it. So if we see HA, that means the experiment works. It's just like a marker similar to GFP, but you can see it's much, much smaller. We need an antibody for it. And I'll get back to that uh, in a few moments, but that was a, a great um, observation and a great uh, sort of follow-up question. So I told you that there is um, actually a huge war uh, sort of going on. Everyone is the first to try to publish because you show dominance in the field and expertise in the field. And the more papers you publish related to a technique, the more likely it is that people are going to come and ask you for help which is a positive feedback cycle. The more likely that you're going to be uh, acknowledged as an expert, and again, more people will be asking you uh, for your help on uh, related topics. So Fang Zhang, not um, very long afterwards, also came out with this paper. Uh, and this paper basically says one thing, and you don't need to worry about the details of this paper. Um, this is a different, it is not Staph pyogenes. This is Staph aureus. Staph aureus can also um, have a Cas9, but its Cas9, its nuclease is actually much smaller. I told you right now, everyone has this issue of trying to package everything in to this really small suitcase. This just makes this suitcase that you're packing in a little bit more efficient. Because if the Cas9 itself is much smaller, you have room for all these other things that you can add in uh, to uh, the uh, the vector that you're trying to deliver. And this is sort of a thing that you might want to look out for. Why, why are people trying to bother um, coming up with new forms of Cas9? If what we have right now is working well, shouldn't we just stick with it? But this is different. It's a different patent. It is not for SP Cas9. This is a new sort of SA Cas9, which is a smaller system also used in in vivo uh, genome editing. So let me take you through some of the aspects of this paper. Again, it, it is in many ways a tour de force of genetics, molecular biology, biochemistry, everything, uh, including like behavioral biology is in this one paper. This is what a modern molecular, cellular, biological neuroscience paper now requires you to be able to do everything, behavior, genetics, biochemistry, staining, imaging, all of that now goes into any type of neuroscience um, paper. The constructs up here at the top are ones that I've shown you um, earlier on. The sizes just indicate they're reaching their max. Hopefully now with a smaller uh, SA Cas9, we might be able to package more into these particular viruses. Uh, and these are the two constructs that are being delivered into different areas uh, of the brain. Okay, and one of the things I'm gonna show you is when they inject in, and they have this guide RNA that glows with uh, GFP or green fluorescent protein, uh, when they go in and they do the transduction where they're physically injecting in the virus, they can actually see on the brain that the, this experiment works. The guide RNA at least is being expressed, may not be targeted to the right groups of nuclei, et cetera, but they're able to see it. In fact, it's so good <coughs> that one of the things that they wanted to do was to actually go in and dissect out only the areas that were glowing green, therefore the only areas that were infected and uh, try to fine tune the amount of material that they're getting. Now they do some classic biochemistry. So they use a density gradient and on a density gradient that you can layer on different um, types of sucrose and this is classic biochemistry on a density gradient, different organelles and different mem uh, compartments of the cell will float on different parts of the sucrose gradient. The nuclei though go to the very bottom when you start to centrifuge on this sucrose gradient. So they get these green cells. They dissect out the green cells. They put it on a sucrose gradient. They start spinning. And when they do one more uh, really, oh, bless you, one more really cool thing is once they have collected all of the cell nuclei, they want to be even more careful. So yes, we have nuclei, and yes, we dissected it as carefully as we could, but we might have non-infected nuclei in there, and we might have some green nuclei in there. Let's take this 
one step further. And again, it's a tour de force if you're thinking about all the steps that are involved. They also take all of the nuclei and then run them through a fluorescence activated cell sorter. So it's able to separate out all of the nuclei into ones that are green versus ones that are not green. So in other words, on one side, you're going to get a pure population of infected nuclei that's taken from a living brain that has um, had been exposed to CRISPR as well as Cas9. And then what they want to try to do is to demonstrate that when we target this particular MECP2 uh, locus, again, here is that PAM sequence to guide the guide RNA. When they do this, do they see the same types of indels in those pure population of green nuclei that Roger Nickel did? Do they see indels? And in fact, when you go straight through, they do. They see a lot of um, mutated loci depending on the guide RNA that they were using. And again, if you read through the article, you'll see the sheer number of nuclei that they were running through, the sheer number of animals that were used. Do you have a really quick question? <laughs> if it's quick, why not ask now? Yeah. That, that again, great question. Doesn't have to be, right? Yeah. Just one virus is enough. But that's part of the beauty of this um, particular cell sorting system. When they go through and then they take the nuclei and then they do sequencing on the nuclei, if nothing happened except it got transfected with or transduced by uh, GFP and it was just guide RNA and no Cas9 was delivered, they shouldn't really expect to see any of these indels, but they do. And so the indels can only occur because the Cas9 or the nuclease was also present. So that's a great question. And there are, there are more uh, parts to this as well. Okay, any other questions before I go on? And again, this, this experiment by itself is not trivial. For someone to sit there, inject this into the brain, and then to be able to micro dissect the brain, then to use a sucrose gradient, isolate nuclei, purify, uh, transduce nuclei, then do micro sequencing on it. I would say that if you were able to do that as an undergrad, I'd be happy to give you like a 98%. I wouldn't give you 100, but I'd give you a 98% on any type of research project that you were doing. That is not a trivial um, experiment. So again, a couple of um, a couple of other things and apologies that um, I hadn't thought until I started reading through and I went through um, some of these notes with uh, one of my colleagues uh, in the office and she wasn't really sure what Cash uh, refer referred to. So I wrote this down for you um, on your test or on your midterm and final exams. Um, I will always give you both the abbreviation as well as the long form so that there is no um, uh, chance that you won't uh, understand what is being asked um, of you. So again, one of the things that makes this unique is this cache sequence or this sign homology domain targets the outer membrane of the nucleus. In other words, it's driving everything to the nucleus uh, just like the, uh, the other uh, signal as well. Again, all of this is really important in technical terms. They have to use neuron specific promoters, MECP2 in this case. Um, they try to make it as small as possible. It's like taking that suitcase that can only fit so much. And uh, if you've ever watched that uh, Mr. Bean sort of um, uh, going on vacation video where he's trying to pack his bag and he's trying to figure out what to pack in his bag, it's like trying to figure out, do I really need that extra pair of socks or not? Or can I get away with like one pair or have uh, one pair of uh, underwear for the entire month of vacation? And it's, it's a lot like that, trying to make do with the bare minimum. And this is the experiment that was done back in 2014. So they wanted to know that question that your colleague was asking. And this is not done, by the way, in the brain. This was done first in cell culture, because that's the way that we do it. We do it in cell culture, a simpler system first, before we go back and look at, at the brain. Now, some of the numbers are a little off here and versus what is in the actual text. Don't worry so much about this. Um, I want to take you through some of the ways in which we do these uh, sort of as molecular biologists. So I told you that this HA signal, which we detect using an antibody, we do immunofluorescence staining on these groups of neurons. These are all the same panel, the same field of view, by the way. 
DAPI tells you and stains all of the nuclei in the cells. And I know that they introduced um, a new lab this year in the third year labs, just so that you would have some experience with it. And you can see these are all, all of these blue um, outline unique nuclei. And you can see that the HA is targeting some of these nuclei. They're in the same place. And that uh, guide RNA is also being targeted to the same place as well. So if you take a look, how efficient was it? How efficient was it in getting it all in the same cell, which is, I believe, another way to put your question. So overall, the efficiency, the co-transduction rate of getting in the Cas9 and the guide RNA was about 75%. It's a little lower on this uh, graph here. Um, and again, don't worry about all the details, but this is the way that they estimated that it's about 75%. The Cas9, the nuclease, and the guide RNA that we're detecting using GFP, and the nuclease that we're detecting using uh, an HA stain, it's about 75%. Not bad, actually, considering you have two different uh, viruses going into the same um, area. So again, they, they, uh, I don't show you all of this, but the AAV mediated expression um, didn't actually um, affect the morphology nor the survival of any of these transduced um, neurons. Now I'm going to be really nitpicky here. Um, the, um, the cache domain, what did I say that it was targeting? Outer membrane, outer membrane of the nucleus. Right, so the inner membrane, outer membrane of the nucleus, uh, nuclear envelope has the cache uh, domains. Um, does that look like the nucleus to you, the green? Is that staining the membrane of the nucleus? No? Yes? Yes, kind of does, doesn't it? Yeah, so... Um, if it, if it were, and again, I'm not saying that it's wrong, I'm just saying that these are things that as scientists, even in a p paper like um, Nature Biotechnology, you should be looking at and maybe thinking about, well, I'm not sure. It's supposed to be targeted to the outer nuclear membrane, but if it's the outer nuclear membrane, shouldn't it just be a ring sort of around the outside of the, um, the nucleus and DAPI staining? because the HA is really right there in the nucleus, and this should be a, a little ring around the outside of it, but it doesn't really look like that. And it's something to, uh, again, think about when you're critiquing different types of papers. So is it working? Yes, can we get S, uh, the um, Cas9 and the guide RNA into the cell? Yes, can we see indels through sequencing? Yes. So now we need to see, is there actually an effect? So you do all this stuff and it works, and it's done in vivo, it's done in a brain, does it actually work? So this MECP2, that methyl CPG binding protein, uh, the shortened form for MECP2, um, has been shown to be involved in a number of learning and behavioral uh, uh, phenotypes, including Rett syndrome, which many of you will uh, maybe recall. And there are severe learning deficits in individuals that have a mutation in MECP2 where they don't learn very well. And it's an X-linked uh, chromosome. Uh, uh, as well. So again, MECP2 is ubiquitously expressed in the neuron. It has a number of unique properties that we can determine through electrophysiological recordings, not in this paper, but in other papers, that if something goes wrong with gene regulation for MECP2, that usually there is a behavioral consequence, whether it's in mice and they can't learn very well, or um, there is learning deficits in humans. So if we disrupt MECP2, there might be uh, some uh, or there might be some uh, issues associated with this. So one of the things that um, Fong Zhang decided to do was he wanted to create a guide RNA that actually targeted exon 3 of the mouse MECP2 gene. So if MECP2 is really that important for learning and memory, and if I target exon 3, which again is very similar, similar to what happens in Rett syndrome, can we actually still see a behavioral effect? And this gets back to some of the questions you were asking before. So he creates uh, six different um, guide RNAs. He actually creates more, but this is the one that's in his published uh, paper. All of them sort of uh, lined up against the uh, relative PAM sequences, which again, I'll, I'll stress this, you should know what a PAM sequence is. You should know what that all means and why there are two GGs, for example, and an A and a T in front of it. You should know uh, those details. And these are sort of the um, uh, different uh, nucleotides that he's using to target that exon 3 of MECP2. 
So bottom line, when he goes and does all of these different types of things, one of the things that he's able to show is that with the right combination of um, having and in, in, uh, taking one of these guide RNAs, the guide RNA that works the best on this particular um, assay down here at the bottom and the efficiency is at 23%, where he's getting all of these um, cleavage products, and this is a nuclease assay. Don't worry about the details. I'm not going to ask you about nuclease or nuclease protection assays, but he's able to show that when he gets these cuts, these are the guide RNAs that work the best. So from this data, he then uses the best guide RNA, and then he uses it in the experiments that I just showed you, and he's able to show that the MECP2 uh, expression goes down dramatically. It's not zero, it's not like Roger Nichols' experiment, but it goes down a lot, and it's statistically significant. And on a Western blot, he also shows that it's uh, dramatically reduced. Um, if you were to bet um, on some of these other lines that you see here, what do you think DSP Cas9 is? So this is the active form. You need uh, the, um, the pyogenes version of the Cas9, the nuclease, for the guide RNAs to work. So what do you think the DSP Cas9 is? Because he has that there as well. He does experiments with them. Yes? Yes, that's right. So it is an inactive form. He has to demonstrate that you know everything else being equal, the nuclease is inactive, but if I inject in this virus, the inactive form of this is not going to work. And, and indeed, he shows that um, very, very uh, clearly. And again, it's a, it's a tour de force. He's, he's actually doing something really cool. He's taking you through step by step. And I, I think some of this is related to probably that um, six month block where he had to go back and address some of these concerns step by step that he's taking you through the logical progression that his experiment is going to work. So he still hasn't answered that question. So we have a really effective guide RNA. We have all of these controls that are available now. And I'll mention that this LACZ is not something that's normally found in the brain. And the LACZ guide RNA is just like having a nonsense sequence, which doesn't do very much. And you can see that having this guide uh, RNA that is against a gene that doesn't even exist in the brain does nothing to the expression of MECP2 in the lanes here on the left. And it's just a, another really good control that he does. So. Is there any consequence? Yes, Danny. A really quick yeah, question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Cas9 has a plus on the first lane. Yep. But it has, but, um, but it shows that it doesn't have a knockout. How come, like, the, shouldn't it be gone as well? Um, um, like so, the, so this lane here on the left? Yeah, the first lane. So the, the guide RNAs are not targeting MECP2. I'm only looking at the expression of MECP2. So the antibody is against MECP2. That's the MECP2 expression. But I have used a guide RNA that actually targets something that doesn't exist in the mammalian brain at all. It's just like having a nonsense sequence. Okay. And I'm still staining for MECP2. So MECP2 hasn't been touched. Remember, it's a relatively specific or very specific reaction. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So is there actually an effect to this? So when they start using this, and again, this is in cell culture, they kind of flip back and forth from cell culture to animal models back to cell culture. There are reasons why we want to do this in cell culture. If we were to do all of these uh, types of experiments, and then we were to introduce guide RNA, uh, SP2 um, guide RNAs uh, into cultures, does it change the morphology? I told you earlier, that no, it doesn't, doesn't cause cell death. But if we leave this long enough and we are specifically targeting MACP2, which has been implicated in learning and memory, what is the overall effect that we see? So if we are specifically targeting in red, the MACP2, which has been associated with learning and memory, one of the things that we see is that there is a dramatic reduction in the complexity of the dendritic arborization. The dendritic arbor has been um, associated with um, having uh, spines as well as having uh, excitatory synapses that are involved in learning and memory. So those are fewer of them. We also hear in panel C, after MECP2 and the, um, uh, the Cas9 delivery, we also have fewer spines themselves on these uh, different dendrites. All of this is showing 
that the um, basic uh, component of learning and memory using SP9, uh, the, gui uh, the nuclease and the appropriate guide RNA for MACP2 dramatically reduces the complexity of the structures that are associated with learning as well as memory, okay? And spine density is affected, complexity of the um, dendritic arborization, and they show this wonderful figure because it's visible by eye because what they're counting are these little mushroom bodies that are protruding off the dendrite that there is a reduction. They're smaller. They're not as robust. There aren't as many of them after using this uh, particular uh, CRISPR-Cas9. Any questions before I go on? Is that clear for everyone? Yes, no, maybe? Need time to think a little bit about it? OK. So some of this was done in vivo. Some of it was done in cell culture. Some of it was kind of going back and forth. And some were done actually in cell lines. The authors actually quoted this at the very outset of their paper. They wanted to directly perturb specific genes I don't know why they didn't use living systems, but within intact biological systems. They want to do this in vivo. They want to be the first to demonstrate this in vivo. Remember, people have done this before. They've used it before. They've published before, but no one has done this in vivo. And they want to perturb these specific genes in this um, biological, intact biological context, which means a, a living animal in vivo. So, they're able to demonstrate that there is a dramatic loss of these MECP2 positive nuclei, especially in the area of the dentate gyrus that has been injected with these um, two different uh, vectors that we've looked at um, previously. Um, and they were also able to show that the MECP2, not only the numbers, but also the amount of protein overall in this area of the brain, MECP2, was also decreased by over 60%. So that means this genome editing technique that they've taken great pains to show that they can measure all these different things has actually been very, very successful. And again, some of this won't turn out well here. What we're looking at here on the left is a stain for uh, MECP2, I believe. Uh, yes, MECP2 at the top, and this is MECP2, this is the dentate gyrus, uh, and this is with the control, the guide RNA that doesn't actually affect anything in a normal mammalian brain. We don't have LAC-Z, therefore it shouldn't affect MECP2, no effect at all on MECP2. Now, when they actually target exon 3, you can see that there's a dramatic decrease in the staining for MECP2. I'm hoping you can see that. There, the, the red dots that you see on panel E on the left versus what you see here on the right um, is dramatically decreased. Yes? Agree or disagree? Yeah? Overall, there is a reduction. And if we take a higher power view and the insight, you can also see this in more detail. Why do you think, by the way, thinking like biologists, thinking critically, um, and not just sort of uh, trying to memorize things, but actually thinking like biologists, why do I need to show DAPI? Why DAPI staining? Isn't what I showed you in red good enough? I'm the great Fong Zhang. Oops, sorry. This is going live on air. <laughs> yes. Um, would it mean to show that the reduction in staining is due to cell death? Absolutely. So here, there is no cell death, nor is there an increase in cells, right? You might also suspect in the dentate gyrus that you might have increased neurogenesis. Um, there might be, but it's not. Um, evident from this. And again, using uh, different Western blotting techniques, they will show you a dramatic decrease that you can see here um, of the MECP2 when they use the specific guide RNA for exon 3. Again, a dramatic show of force. This is done in vivo. This is not done in cell culture. This is taken from the dentate gyrus of animals that have had both viruses delivered. Again, it's a humongous amount of work to be able to do um, all of these different uh, experiments. Just out of curiosity, uh, this lane down here, the GAPDH, or sometimes you'll see this as G3PDH, what is this? Some of you who do Western blotting, what do we, why do we need this lane here? Yes. It's a loading control to make sure that um, no one is sort of fudging things and loading less protein on the right, and that's why we have less uh, staining. We do this stain first, we show you this, then we take the exact same um, 
Western blot membrane, we strip it of antibodies, then we come back and we stain again with this. So it's the same membrane, it's been stained uh, twice. And we can show that it's not because we're loading less protein, we have the same amount of GAPDH, which is found in all cells, and so we are looking at a dramatic decrease in uh, MECP2 staining. What else could I have used as a loading control? Some of you who are doing biology, and maybe you can uh, jot these down. You might see it again on a, on a multiple choice test question. Yes. You could use beta actin. Anything else that some of you use? So GAPDH, beta actin. Sorry? Ponso staining. Yes, it's not an antibody derived staining. It's a classic um, just uh, red stain that you do, a ponso rouge or ponso S stain on a membrane to show loading. Anything else that you would use as an antibody? Those of you who are doing Western blots? Yes. You could use tubulin. So any sort of cytoskeletal uh, marker that is consistent between cells, we could use those as loading controls as well. So any one of those, he would have shown exactly the same. Um, oh, I can't believe I wrote that. I'm sorry. Apologies on the use of semi-foul language. Um, so this is ultimately the test. As neurobiologists, this is what we want to do. Remember I told you MECP2, Rett syndrome, Rett syndrome, they have issues with learning and memory. So what sort of technique could we use, because we're delivering it into the dente gyrus, to see if there's any deficits in being able to pick up what you've learned? What can we learn using the dente gyrus, in other words? So if MECP2 is really that important in learning, one of the things that we can use is what is known as a contextual fear conditioning model or paradigm. Can anyone in two sentences really quickly tell me what is contextual fear uh, learning or what you remember about this? Yes. Yes. Okay, so so almost, almost, yeah, that's pretty good. That's actually right. Um, in a certain room, in a certain context, if the animal gets um, some sort of shock, what do we normally see them do, though? We don't see them running. They start to freeze. So they could learn. Uh, if you do it enough, then yes, you could induce learned helplessness. In this con context, they will actually freeze. That's what they've learned. If they stop more, when they hear sound, because they associate that sound or this room, if you put them in a certain room or a context that they will start freezing, then you know that they've learned. They've paired that association. If I see a room that has like really poorly painted walls with um, uh, some sort of uh, slide up there doing molecular biology, I should go and run the other way because I know it's, it's uh, something that's not good for me. Whatever the context that has been learned, you will start to um, uh, make that association if learning occurs. So can we demonstrate in these mice that all of this actually occurs? Um, and one of the remarkable things is they do this experiment twice. And this is really where Fang Zhang decides not to just be Fang Zhang, but he decides to go like guerrilla tactic, everything all at once. Um, I can do anything I want to if I want to. Uh, type of experiment. So I'm going to take you through the first one, which is relatively simple, um, which is can we actually see this freezing behavior in mice with and without MECP2? If MECP2 is important in learning and memory and we've used CRISPR to knock out MECP2, can we then see the uh, lack of that learning uh, behavior? So again, uh, if you go through all the data, um, which is again very similar to what I've shown you all already, um, if he knocks all of these proteins down and then he looks at freezing behavior after MECP2 in a certain context, these animals stop freezing. The higher the bar is, the better you have learned. So a normal animal with the dentate gyrus at MECP2 intact because the lac Z is just a control, they will freeze at this level. And when you compare the MECP2 knockdown, through the CRISPR-Cas9, they don't freeze as much. They don't remember. This is a bad room to be in. I should maybe not be here. Um, and so in an altered context, which they don't make that association, they've never learned it, it doesn't matter. But this is the bar that should be just as high as the one here on the left. It should be at the same level. But after CRISPR-Cas9, it's reduced. Believable? Do you think this is good? Good data? 
Yes. Good data? Yeah. Uh, Wait, we're pointing at each other. This is fun. <laughs> Good. Do you, do you, do you, do you <laughs> so naive animals. Uh, it might have. An extra control might have. A naive animal without any manipulations done to it uh, a priori might have. Um, but do you believe this result? That if I knock down, no, skeptic, it's Fong Zhang. Hippocampus. Hippocampus, maybe. Spatial learning, maybe. But this is conditioned fear learning. It's been associated with the, the dente gyrus, maybe. It's Fong Zhang, come on. Anyone else? Like the statistics, get that little one star. If you're, if you're in research, and to be honest, this is bad, but if you're in research and you take these results to your PI and they go, not bad, go back and do this experiment three more times. Let's see if we can get the um, error bar smaller or more statistically significant. He's not happy with this. This is a pretty good result. It's done in an intact animal. The behavior has been tested. This has been uh, several weeks to a month after the injection, and he's not happy with this result. And so what he decides to do is he goes nuts, okay? He does this experiment again. A lot of these details are already the same, but let me take you to the construct that he's using here on the right. This is a little different. This construct that you see here still has this GFP. It's still targeted to the outer nuclear membrane using the cache domain. He's still using these guide RNAs, but, I, but take a look at this. He's no longer just targeting one gene. He is now targeting three genes at the same time. He is wondering, well, okay, so if you do a transgenic animal and then you knock out gene A, gene B might come up to compensate for it. We've had this discussion earlier on today. And he's wondering, in the context of CRISPR, no one's done this before yet anyway, so I might as well do it because I'm Fong Zhang and why not? Give it a shot. I'm going to knock out three genes in an intact animal at the same time and I'm going to see if I can get a better effect. Okay, so he is using what is known as, I think it's up here somewhere, uh, what is multiplexing. And this is multiplexing where it's not just one guide RNA, three guide RNAs against three separate genes are being targeted by that nucleus at the same time, okay? So this one gene was great, showed a statistically significant effect. However, he wants to actually generate three separate guide RNAs in tandem, uh, st still targeted for, for the nucleus, and he wants to target all of these DNA methyltransferases, uh, DNT, DNMT1, DNMT3A, 3B, et cetera, and all of these, again, are highly expressed in the adult brain, required for synaptic plasticity. He didn't get a great result. He wants to go back. Do the same thing, show that knocking down genes can actually result in a behavioral change. This is no longer MECP2, this is sort of a different DNA methyltransferase. The, the long story short, um, one of the things that he shows is that yes, this, this is possible. You can do it. Uh, I won't go through all of the details um, that he goes through, but he can also show that this is a long-lasting effect. There is no washout, similar to Roger Nickel. And that in addition to this, these uh, DN DNMTs, which have been hypothesized to be involved in uh, learning and memory, are also a route for disruption of learning and memory as well. This triple knockdown, uh, where normally in the past, we would have actually uh, had to have gone, oops. In the past, we would normally have had to have gone and crossed three different knock knockout animals. Yes. Sorry, is it like there, when you say knockdown versus knockout, is there like a difference when you? Like, I, I think they're being careful because it's in in many cases they're still able to detect something. Okay. Um, so if it's a complete knockout, you would assume that there's nothing to be detected, so but they're still seeing. Um, I think it's safer to say knock down, but in many cases he also uses the word knock out because he has actually demonstrated that in that in the cells that he has specifically targeted, not not in the entire structure where it's knocked down, but in each cell it's completely knocked out. 
But if you have 70% of the cells knocked out, it's, it's just a knockdown. It's not every cell. One day they'll get to the stage where it's like everything. Um, so these triple knockdown um, animals um, show this uh, consistent and uh, impaired memory under training context. Now, I put this slide up here. I'm going to leave it up here for a few minutes. Uh, I want you to think a little bit about this. So here is um, here are the three different genes that were targeted, the DNA methyltransferases. Each of these have been implicated. Uh, and 3B is not up here, but uh, each of these has been implicated in learning and memory and playing a role in learning and memory. And you can see that when they have the uh, guide RNAs to knock these down, that there is indeed a knockdown of the um, gene product or the, the protein in this case. He then goes back in and he does that same conditioned fear contextual memory paradigm. And he shows that following training in, a, in an animal where you don't really get um, disruption of the learning pathway because the guide RNA is not specific or he doesn't use uh, the uh, full guide RNAs, that this is sort of the freezing that he gets, lots of freezing going on, and that this is what he gets after he knocks down the three different genes. Good data? Looks worse, but you got three stars up there, Danny. If you if you went to Lorraine, if, if you went to Lorraine or you went to Sunil and said, look, I got three stars on my data. I'm going home for the day. They'd be pretty happy, wouldn't they? Doesn't three stars mean it's more statistically significant than one star? Wouldn't you rather have like on, remember in grade school where you had the bulletin board and you got little stars? Don't you want more stars? But he has three stars here now and you're complaining about this? Why? Why does the data look worse to you? That's a good point. This is what I want you to think about as neurobiologists. Why? Yeah. Yeah. But it's still st statistically yeah. significant. But it doesn't look good. You, you think that it would be worse. You think that it would be after knocking out three different genes responsible for DMNT. So you, you think it should be lower? Yeah. You'd okay. You, you'd freeze less, which is you don't learn as much. You freeze less if you knock down three genes. Agree? Yes. I don't know. Maybe there's a correlation here, though. I hadn't thought of it until you and Danny mentioned it. But if you knock out three and you get three stars, what if you knocked out four? Would you get four stars? Maybe? Yes. Yep. Po possibly. It could be an effect size phenomenon. Yep. Po possibly. Yep. It's a good point. It's a very valid point. Ah, uh, I think you, yes, David. Yep, po possibly, yep. Yep, it's entirely possible. It's also a really valid point, David. Yes, at the back. Sorry, I don't know your name yet. <laughs> He, he does actually show it in the supplementals, which again, this is a nature biotechnology paper. It's supposed to be relatively short, but the supplementals is as long as his paper. Yeah, it's a good point. Tiangu? Uh, I just wanted to add, for air conditioning, yeah. it's always kind of a baseline. Yeah? Yeah? You don't go before below a certain number. So that's that's great. And I think I heard this here earlier. So this is... all. So are the results, by the way, you do some of this type of behavioral test in Sheena Jocelyn's lab, right? Your results are pretty consistent with your lab results? Well, do you get the same number, like in terms of freezing, baseline freezing, et cetera? Yeah, pretty much. But, but this, is, this is their baseline number, OK? This is what they had originally. This is not the same. As this number here. They're freezing more. Their baseline is different. So maybe that accounts for some of the lack of cleanliness of, of the data. I'm not sure. It's still a fascinating paper. 
it is still one of the uh, papers that is cited because it's done in vivo. It is really a tour de force in terms of genetics, molecular biology, cellular biology, uh, in terms of behavior, neuroscience, uh, biochemistry, pure brute force biochemistry. I don't think most of you actually do um, gradient spins anymore. So pure brute force biochemistry. It's it's in, in many ways uh, a crazy type of paper. Um, and whether or not, uh, you'll have to tell me because I want to know uh, how much of a background uh, you have in all of this. So they they do other tests, as they should. They're good neurobiologists, right? So they've done this genetic manipulation. They put this into the brain in the in the dente gyrus, and now they went and did all these tests. They don't see any changes in the behavior of mice that have been CRISPRed, if you can use that term. If you can Google something, you can CRISPR something. So after CRISPRing something, um, in the open field, elevated plus, and novel object recognition tests, they don't see any difference between the CRISPRed animals and their controls. Good or bad? Bad? Why bad? So when they saw the effect on the, um, the conditioned uh, fear, contextual fear conditioning, they didn't see an effect on the open field, elevated plus, or novel object recognition. Good or bad? Yes. It's only contextual. It only affects that sort of learning paradigm. They don't have increased anxiety. For example, the open field test, one measure of, of anxiety is the open field test. The elevated plus maze, again, is another sort of indice of um, anxiety. And this novel object recognition is a simple way to uh, look at short-term memory in these animals. So specific systems, in other words, were interrogated. Specific systems showed an effect, but not everything was affected exactly as you'd want to be able uh, to demonstrate. Um, okay, and again, the big question, why is it a knockdown versus a complete knockout? Um, we only have a fraction of the targeted cells. It's not 100% yet. One day we'll get to the point where we can target and get 100% of the cells being affected, but right now the best that they can do, and if that's the best they, they can do, I don't think uh, the rest of the world can do much better, is that a fraction of the cells are actually perturbed by this um, uh, Cas9 uh, guide RNA system. So again, this is the last quote that they sort of have in their paper. Um, in these complex tissues, including the brain, where they want to do more research, and uh, again, if you went down to the Society for Neuroscience this year, you know that they already are. They're doing and investigating and interrogating more complex systems. They have to be carefully designed, which is one of the things that he is trying to show. Um, and again, it might be some real, there might be some really cool effects out there if you do your experiments well. So um, Thursday, we're going to go back and review the MDX or the last of the uh, three-part harmony because that is actually in itself a very different type of paper than the papers we've looked at. So we looked at using biolistics to, to deliver uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and we see effects there. First paper out there. This tour de force paper in Nature Biotechnology, very different. Um, and then we'll go back and review the MDX paper. Um, if you're thinking about this, are there any technical considerations or limitations that are holding us back right now? Yes? Yeah, so right now, in terms of delivering different viruses, if we are sticking with the AAV system and we uh, don't go with the lentiviral system, we are still limited by how much we can pack into that um, vector. So there are some technical ones. We are actually going to come back and talk about some of the ethical ones. We are going to go back and revisit when we do um, germline editing using similar methods, uh, what are some of the caveats uh, that we need uh, to think about as well. Um, I'm going to tell you that um, on your midterm, the uh, lecture that we had on Thursday, the lecture that we had today, you know, you're going to get a lot of representation on it. So I need you to do two things. Um, I don't need you, to, by the way, to be able to tell me all of the results back from the experiments. The experiments are there to get you to think about using the different types of techniques. I need you to know what goes into CRISPR-Cas9. Like, how do we get these guide RNAs? That's the first step. That was done on Thursday. Um, how do we make these uh, guide RNAs? What are some of the considerations? Um, what are some of the issues 
of um, uh, using like um, RNAi versus like using CRISPR-Cas9. So those types of things I want you to think about. I don't need you to be telling me um, in the um, Fong Zhang's paper or Roger Nichols' paper, I'm not going to be asking you for specific results. They'll be given to you in terms of a multiple choice test question, but I want you to be thinking about the applications. Uh, this weekend, because I know all of you spent all your time on the, on the past weekend um, studying nothing but HMB360, right? That's all you did. Good. I like that. I know it's a lie, but I still like it. Um, this weekend, though, I want you to put some time away to study for uh, the upcoming midterm. It is a midterm that I'm going to make fair, and I am going to uh, make sure that you're well prepared for it, but it's not something that you can study the night before and expect to get um, an 80 or an 85. If you're going to get 100 or 95 or whatever it is, uh, you're going to need to know some details, and I'm going to uh, make sure that you understand precisely uh, what you need to know. The list that I gave you on the weekend, how many of you read that? The sort of checklist? <laughs> okay. <laughs> A lot of you had some uh, a great weekend. That's great. Okay, cool. I like like that too. I think as students, you should have a great weekend. Um, if you follow what's on the um, outline given to you on the announcements page, you are you are capable of getting a hundred percent just by following the um, points that are outlined from those two lectures. I will be providing you with something similar this weekend, so you know exactly what to study and what you need to be able to know. And I will give you a practice question for you to discuss wherever you want to be able to discuss it. Yes, at the back before we go. When is the midterm? Uh, it is the Tuesday after reading week. You're welcome.